that thing and i realized like at the moment it's like shit and then i tried to correct it as white presenting it's like gosh i want to ask you this do you believe in the model minority kind of a perception of asian americans in the united states believing it to be real or believing it as regards of like do you think there are black people out there who see asians as the model minority and actually group them together with white people as equivalents when i was in kindergarten i thought i was white Talking about last week. Absolutely right. Do you believe that you have a different relationship with the social and political systems in society based on who you are? You, you are a white, I'm assuming, I'm assuming middle class Asian American. White presenting, I should say. So you, I'm, so you're I'm white, white <laughs> presenting? Wait, wait. What? What? Yeah, what? A white presenting Asian. Me, what the let me, heck? Let me rephrase that. Let me rephrase can you that. Look at, can you look at me can, right now? I can, I this can is what? No. I can simplify that for you. I can simplify that for you if that upset you. Is it, is it appropriate to call that a gaff? Um, yeah, I guess you could say it was a gaff. Um, yeah, I, guess I would categorize it as that. Mm -hmm. And just as a full disclaimer, I tried watching the entirety of that segment of Hippie mm -hmm. Dippy today, but I wasn't able to finish it. I think I got like a good maybe 60% of it had to sure. stop because 7 o'clock. Um, so if, if I'm missing some things, then oh, there's, yeah, for there's sure. that. Uh, but basically, how about this? You describe it yourself. Cause sure, yeah. Um, and you, okay, where do we start? So I guess where we'll start, we start? Like, the full encapsulation of the thing. So I'll, like, I'll do the thing, rather like the panel itself, the thing in question, and then kind of like where that stemmed from there. I'll try to be short. Um, so one of the topics on hippie dippy was around, I don't remember what was around at this point. Critical race um, theory. Yes, critical race theory. Um, and it was just like, a, just a general back and forth of like, just basically Kenny Zhu was on it and he was basically the punching bag. I knew his, his arguments um, because I read his book and I consumed his content prior, but this was like from months ago when he was like, like introduced from, um, Rashid from uh, Dr. Rashid on the bullpen, stuff like that. Um, so I knew his arguments going in there. And then uh, the point in question was around his antagonization of identity politics. And something that I was trying to pinpoint with him is that his visible identity make up his, in, like, make up his relationships with like all the systems in not only like just in the United States, but just how he relates with like, school education yeah. um and stuff like that and the in question the the moment in question i had i think i still have it over here too. i had a bunch of just handouts and things printed out and during the time of the debate i was reading them in real time to try to just like keep things kind of centered on what i was going to say and the one that i had up in question was about different um percentages of white sentiment in the united states and i was reading that while i was talking to kenny because i wanted to shift it to a different point in the conversation but as i was going through what i had what his perceived and visible identifiers i just said white just i said i think it was something like white asian american and yeah. then i clarified that and said white presenting and the reason yeah. why i said that was because i was reading that that thing and i realized like at the moment it's like shit and then i tried to correct it as white presenting it's like oh shit that made it worse and, <laughs> yeah, it <did. laughs> and, and then like what was funny is that there was two things that were happening at the same time this is like kind of like the post of it right where on there was kenny just presenting with the information they had like he had a clear optical w on the antagonization of crt oh yeah so he took that and cashed in and then the whole time i'm sitting there like yep this is this is deserved this is deserved and the whole time it's like this wasn't what i meant to say to him so that's also why after like during the panel and after like i apologize and we were able to like to chop shop and, yeah. and kind of like sort that out and then do you want to talk we... about the after twitter all that oh! stuff you, you want to mention that <laughs> yeah so dan about like and i'll be be honest like that was probably the only clippable moment of that panel 
if I'm being like kind of objective, objectively speaking. Hippie so at the time, like, together. I, yeah, so I totally get it. Like that was the thing. Like Danilo told me, I was like, all right, yeah, this it happened. <laughs> like it didn't. And what was funny is that there were sort of two camps at the same time. Um, and I think this is how like this conversation ended up to be. There was Camp A, who only knows my appearances on panels and kind of who I was before the reformation of my Twitter account. So they were just going in on the paint of like, Joe is racist, Joe is racist, Dana sectist. Black nationalist. Black na- you know, all this nonsense. And, and then there was the other camp of like, hang on, like within the clip and context, it's probably not what he said. And like, let's explore what he's talking about and then take it from there. And like you, I would say you were one of those voices. There's like a handful of people who were, um, and then also too, it's just like my DMS got, I did not know how like it was possible. I got over a hundred DMS of different individuals, like either one in clarify, there's like two camps of it, right? There's like, what the, what did you mean? And let's explore that. Or you're a racist piece of shit. You should never like go online again, type of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. I, I responded to as many as I could. I think I got everybody, but even then, it's like I did the best I could in terms of that regard. I think. Yeah, um, and it's Twitter. Yeah. So, so you and I, we've I think known each other for a, a while now, and yeah. I know that you like to talk about race. Like that's one of your bread and butter issues that you want to advocate for on this platform. Yeah. And when I heard that clip, I was like, I know Joe isn't like this. And so he probably meant it in the way that I actually would have taken it. So when I was watching that clip, Danibal's clip, that was the first thing that I saw about it. I I was not interested in, and I really am interested in any hippy dippy stuff. But like the first thing that you said of like asking him, getting him pinned down on, okay, connecting your identity to other systems and how that affects back and forth that first third was good but then kenny was like what and then you you wanted to clarify and then now that given the extra context of you were reading something yeah that's when it went like okay you were on the right track and then completely 180 Mm -hmm. and the thing is too and this is something that you probably ran into too is that are are people functioning in a way where they don't understand because you're not articulating it properly or are they not understanding because it's contradictory to the argument that you're making, you know? And it's a little bit sometimes, of both. Yeah. yeah. In my opinion. And then, yeah. And that trap is like, okay, how do I clarify it with this individual in a way that they can understand and the audience can understand, but also isn't so incredibly diluted that just seems like you're just trying to like sort of hold somebody's hand through the argument, you know? Mm-hmm. But then that was probably the thing is that at the second third, it was completely impossible for you to ever do that because uh, Kenny was able right. to basically run off of that optically, make himself as the victim, regardless if that was like his attention or not, that was the mm-hmm. effect. And then it, 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 all, it all goes downhill. Uh, which yeah. I think is actually really sad because there is a meaningful discussion on uh, Asian Americans in relation to racism that does not happen a lot on this platform. And so, yeah, I thought it would, it would be really great for us to uh, kind of talk about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. It was especially really weird because, like, as you said, Kenny was the punching bag. He was the person who was a, a minority being uh, Asian presenting. And going against the like what would be the typical woke argument of hey, critical race theory, racism matters, blah blah blah. And he's like saying, No, I'm a minority, and this is not how that works, X, Y, and Z reasons, right? And then all of a sudden, it's like, Okay, nobody, everybody forgets that he has these kinds of positions of racism doesn't matter and then all like the woke people are and then attacking you i thought that was really interesting uh i mean yeah that was <laughs> somebody brought that up i forget which chat i saw that in where it was interesting how he was saying some weird stuff about black americans mm-hmm. and i was just like they're bro, culturally gonna... inferior something like that yeah it was it was like so close to the edge and what's 
kind of sucks about it is that certain arguments around um like taking truths within a racialized group but then using those truths as a means of antagonization towards that group mm -hmm. and it was like really like yikes but yeah but i again, think like, like i knew that walking in so it wasn't like something that i was like I'm surprised about that's kind of why i wasn't saying anything yeah so then like for example when i think it was you who brought up policing or he brought up policing Mm. And he, he said that, okay, well, it's proportional to crime rates and things like that. Um, that that really was, like, really off-putting. And no, no matter how you you look at Kenny, like, the way that he presents uh, the suit and all and, and whatnot, you, I think it is kind of correct to assume of, like, his background. But then you even asked him to clarify, like, okay, like, what is your background? Uh, say, like, well... Uh, how long have you been in the United States? Were you born here? Where do you live? And to contextualize that, because, you know, like, that, that kind of sounds like even like yeah. a bit stereotypical. I myself am that kind of a person. I live in suburbia. I was born here, grew up here. I went to uh, a, a really good school. And I, I, after high school, I went on to a four-year degree on the East Coast, which is like, I'm that East Coast liberal shill like that's me yeah like that east coast like liberalist try and yeah. even then like you mentioned that on different um panels like whether it be all asian everything or even like when it hit that point in like an andre space where like it's very clear how um your like there's there's two levels of it right there's like your who you are as a person mm -hmm. and then like what you believe yourself to be and then like what society perceives you to be and then those two things are kind of like in a constant sort of struggle with each other, you know? Yeah, which is really difficult for Asian Americans because it's a really diverse group. And yes. you've, you've mentioned that. And I, I think that's like one of the biggest points is that if we're going to talk about like Asian American racism, is that like, oh, it's all racism or there's none. There's it, it's it's more like 50 50 here and there. There's like a bunch of outcomes when it comes to like maybe education or income here and there that there are explanations for like why that's the case. Uh, but then there's also what uh, I think Kevin brought this up in the panel, which was, well, what about what Trump was doing with COVID, calling it the con flu, Chinese virus? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. So then <laughs> it's and it, then, I, I just like yeah. it, it's so weird. Um I don't know. Continue. Yeah, no, I was going to say, like, something that unironically is DRD posits, which I do agree with. I think this was, um, I think, uh, God, I forget which scholar brings it up, where it's that racialized groups in the United States get lifted and discarded based on how dominant society needs them for. So, yeah. for example, like, you'll get Black Lives Matter, and you'll get, like, a very high vibration of that. But then you'll look at like truths. We're like, yes, there is, there was a incident in a bunch of hair salons, and then that stemmed with, coupled with the antagonization of Chinese Americans, you get um, stop Asian hate, and then that becomes the the pillar and sort of like the the driving force of like, okay, there is this racism in this racialized group, but there's also this racism in this racialized group, mm -hmm. and then it kind of felt like once um the i forget like the stop asian hate bill i forget the name of the name of the bill broadly like once that got passed it kind of seemed like democrats kind of like yep we're good guys <laughs> it's like wait it's a minute over. no there's yeah, there's still problems <laughs> and and that's frustrating because there's like even within like community i live in and others where it's like no like these issues of social interactions with racism as they relate to like broader politics still exist. And just because you pass a bill um, doesn't mean that you can't like, you can't continue addressing these things or you shouldn't I say rather. Sorry. Yeah. So then I want to ask you this. Do you believe in the model minority kind of a perception of Asian Americans in the United States? Believing it to be real or believing it as regards of like, that it's a thing that exists. Does that make sense? That make... Both. Both. I would say that the model minority myth 
exists in that it's used as a way to <laughs> sounds because it's gonna sound kind of weird to say, mm -hmm. but a way of people sort of absolving themselves of the racism in the United States. So what that can kind of look like is that you might get a more liberalized approach. I mean, he's the term liberal very, very loosely. And that's, it's sort of a caricature of that. Oh, well, look at how successful this racialized group is. And because this racialized group is successful, that doesn't mean we should stop altogether, but we should like highlight these, like highlight the success and highlight these, um, these accolades and, and or give accolades rather. Yeah. And then there's a more conservative aspect of it that I've observed where it's because of the successes of this racialized group that there's something else going on in the communities of other racialized groups. So, and that we shouldn't just assume that everything is racist because of the outcomes. We should look at like, well, what are people doing that are influencing those outcomes? And we, we should look towards Asian Americans as a means of like, oh, because they're doing X, Y, and Z, why aren't these other groups doing X, Y, and Z? Because clearly working for them, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So you recognize that it exists and used for arguments in a certain ways, but then you yeah. also say that it's a myth. So you, like, you don't actually believe it to be true. I don't believe it to be true in the context of the the conclusions that people are making mm -hmm. um if that makes sense but then you believe in like the premises that that are true i believe that the premises within like the model like the sort of like the traditional like tropes of that caricature yeah they exist in all ra in, in all racialized groups it's not mm -hmm. something exclusive to Asian Americans, but I think that it's being used as a way to justify um, other things in different in different aspects. Sure. So there's a yeah. truth here and there, and I, I think one of them that may not have been addressed on the panel was why are Asian Americans, the top tenth percentile of them, doing so much better than the top tenth percentile of any other racialized group, and I don't think anybody mentioned immigration in that. No, I was, I was going to try to, I was trying to knock on that mm -hmm. door when I was mentioning, I think it was like Filipinos earlier in the conversation. Um, because like, and you probably know this already, like there's like, sure there's attainment financially, but then there's also a huge wealth disparity. So it's like, how do you have both of those things functioning at the exact same time? You know? Yeah, and it's because, um, I guess, I, I, I don't know if this was something that you were trying to get at on the panel, but when it comes to Asian American, Asian immigration into the United States, it's come in waves. Yes. And a lot of those coming in waves were uh, slowed down by stuff like the Exclusion Act, as well as other things that were barring them. So, like, Asian Asian immigration into the United States right now is like really high, and it's one of the fastest growing demographics. I know I think it is the fastest growing demographic yes, yeah. in the United States. But despite that being the fact, it's also a very there's very few of us in the United States, and the reason why that's the case is because we were blocked. Right. But the reason why it started to become more open is because well. There was this idea of let's start taking talent from all over the world. So like uh, like HB1 visas when it came to mm -hmm. uh, Asians were like really high. Um, and so then you have all this talent from around the world coming to the United States, working as doctors, engineers, computer science, they were coders. And then that kind of goes into the stereo feeding into the stereotype of, wow, Asians are doing so well and so then like how i would explain the top 10th percentile doing so well is because th they were already doing well beforehand in terms of their skills and they had the money in order to get into the united states and move here in the first place and and all these things this has uh i would say like little to do with oh 
black people and Asian people were at the same starting point, but then somehow Asian people, because of some cultural differences, were able to uh, come out on top and be on edge because, like, mm. e even for me, uh, my parents were immigrants from Taiwan, and one of them had a college education here, and we were able to uh, do do stuff, but we're we're not within like the the top ten percentile, and uh, we're we're, we're oh, middle yeah. class. And as as you said, like this completely disregards all of the Asians that were here in in the first place, in that like they there were families that came in maybe to work on the railroad. But then because of problems with generational wealth, as well as uh, education attainment, they, they were not able to uh, accrue the same way. So like it, it was really weird when uh, Kenny brought up that, oh, the reason why Asians are doing so well is because they were staying here longer. And that's actually counter to the fact the yeah, Asians that are is... doing well here <laughs> moved here recently. They're rich. Yeah. They're rich Asians from <laughs> other countries. Yeah, and what's what's concerning about it too is that you can see, and th and this is gonna sound like very like left leaning of like a culture of white supremacy, where it's like, of course, racialized groups in concentrated areas they're gonna have similar experiences with those systems if they're not addressed properly. So if you're not going to address the poverty in a city, that's not only going to affect white Americans. It's also going to, because of so many other factors, disproportionately affect other members of racialized groups, especially if they are um, not part of the white demographic or considered part of the white demographic. Mm -hmm. And then when you're tackling issues, it's like, okay, do we do a concentrated approach? And there's like, a, then it's like the whole like policy discussion. But yeah, so then speaking of that demographic. Uh... I think you're. I, I think I know your answer, but like, would you consider Asian Americans white? I would, per like personally, I would not. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is kind of where the the um complication of of language came in within that debate, because like what I describe as passing and what I describe as presenting are two totally different things. Mm -hmm. Um, it's more of like a, the idea of like neo passing and neo presenting um because i guess to, to answer this a bit more give a better like concrete like explanation is that i think asian americans are able to like any other racialized group to adopt certain aspects of american culture that are deemed acceptable and are shown to yield good results yeah and because of that there's a there's sort of like a decision you have to make where like do you keep parts of your birth culture and preserve that or do you discard it because it's incompatible with the area that you're living in so like you'll mm -hmm. have say like pockets of chinatown or like well chinatown's in different cities where it's like a very hyper concentrated expression of chinese culture it's not exclusory you can anybody can move to chinatown brooklyn but there's like a thing to remember of like, okay, if I'm an Amer if I'm like a, a American presenting individual, I might not be able to just walk to a store and talk to the store owner about something. I mm -hmm. might just need to do my business and and go ahead. That's not I don't consider that truly exclusatory. But at the same time, it does limit your ability to potentially expand outward into other communities that are American presenting. Um and if that's something that people want to do, that's their choice to make. Um, so I think Asian Americans and really all members of, especially um, immigrants in the United States broadly, have to kind of make that choice very early in their acculturation and socialization, where it's like, what do I keep? What do I discard? And then what happens, which is why I think people really got upset with the idea of white presenting, is that, sure, I could have said white presenting and then... A, a person might like, okay, he's actually talking about what it means to be white presenting in the United States, but people are very sort of, I guess, fixed on what the physical presentation of that is. Mm -hmm. When I think it's beyond that, like, sure, there's a physical aspect of presenting, but there, for a lot of racialized groups, they can never fully present to be what it means to be white. I think that you have to, in order for that to happen, like to, to completely happen, 
when you are like truly white passing, you have to not only present white physically, but also present in your language, your expressions, your mannerisms, and your arguments against your own racialized group. So it's a matter of like not only arguing against that, but discarding that as issues and part of your identity altogether. And I haven't seen a person yet, at least in 2022, who is open and willing to do that, to be like truly passing, where like in the face of discrimination, you just go back to the talking points of like, oh, it's because these people just don't work hard enough or they don't do X, Y, and Z. Um, so I think like those things, especially pre presenting passing and adjacent are diff mean different things sort of in terms of survival now than they did during Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. And in, in some ways, Kenny was kind of doing that. I, I, I actually kind of hate that we're, we're mentioning him like so many times. Um, so probably like another example would be like Candace Owens, right? In that sure, sure. you have a person who is of a color, but then they completely reject the idea that color has anything to do with systematic outcomes and they actually argue against uh, th their own group of people. And... Yeah, and what's funny, not to cut you off there, mm -hmm. but what's funny about that is, the and the reason why I don't think most, if not all, members of racialized groups can be truly passing is that that, for me, there shouldn't be like a reflection back into our identity. So what that would look like for Candace Owens to completely delve down there is that there will be like language in a way that would reject the very idea that she's black in the first place. Oh, like her saying, oh, I'm not black. Or not even saying, oh, I'm not black, but just the rejection of that identification. So like, let's say someone will say something like, oh, but you are black. And then she would, the language would be, I don't use my race as a means to, to like say that I'm like a victim of a system or that. Mm. You know race isn't so important like, to me. Yeah, like race isn't a factor for me. Therefore, mm -hmm. saying that I'm black is meaningless to me. That type of language. Yeah, and so, Kenny yeah, so, did do yeah. that. And I, I just want to, the point is, is that, or, or the point that I'm trying to get at is that most Asian Americans do not agree with him. I, I am yeah, one. <laughs> I learned that <laughs> For <too>. example. <laughs> um, where it's, and what's funny is that, and, and again, like, I, I don't think, I don't believe that, that an individual like Kenny is that far gone in like the, the observation of the world around him. I just think like, mm -hmm. okay, it's possible to adopt this perspective in a particular sort of like set of events, because if you are an Asian American and you like, let's say, cause this is what liberals do <laughs> um, where like, if you look at affirmative action policies and you see how they navigate around Asian Americans, it's been pretty bizarre in that you'll have a, a group of Asian Americans saying like X, let's say like school a school a has mm -hmm. high achievement for Asian Americans. Then all those Asian Americans that apply to the schools that you would expect people of academic success to have, they're receiving rejection letters. Yeah. And it's like, well, why am I receiving rejection letters? If I'm one of the top performers in my school mm -hmm. and then like, and then obviously schools like factor in so many other things. And then you're able to hyper-focus on things like, like a school might argue like, well, if your extracurricular resume isn't very sufficient for what we're looking for, for an all encompassing um, student, what do they call it? Um, student representative or some nonsense like that. And if you get enough of those letters <laughs> with similar language, you might think like, oh, they're trying to say that like Asian Americans are not like full citizens of society because of how they interact with social environments, which is a stereotype in of itself. But if you get enough of that, I could definitely see somebody making that argument. And this is regardless of like, whether it be like happening to Asian Americans, what happened to black Americans, stuff like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And despite that even being an occurrence where that issue has been taking it up to the Supreme Court. I wonder what result that actually came out to be. Asian Americans are still getting into these top schools at high yeah. rates. Yeah. So I, I don't think it's that alarming. And then even for me, like I applied to Harvard. I got rejected. I went to a state school and I thought I did just as well. And I was just as happy. I got my degree. And like in terms of like the differences between 
having to go to uh, an Ivy League versus any other school, I think there's like very little difference there. Because if you mm-hmm. actually believe yourself to be a top performer, you're going to do well in any school. And you're going to do well in like any sort of a job that you're given or that you want to pursue or any sort of that type of career. Which is why it kind of like, it really pisses me off when so many people are so married to this idea of having to go to this one particular school as if it's life or death for them. As Mm -hmm. if like going to any other school is going to result in them being a failure in life in which that is just not the case. Yeah, and on top of that too, what's frustrating, and I guess it's like reiterating the door that you're knocking at, is that there's more to college than just the degree that's on your wall. Oh, true. Because it's like the connections that you make while you're there. And I think schools to an extent do that where they like, and it's like, it's a frustrating thing or where, or not a frustrating thing, but it might be like a demoralizing thing where like, for example, I had one student who applied to the man school of music and they got in, but then they didn't get any scholarship. And I asked the clarinet teacher over there, or who was like a, who was a decent friend of mine. I was like, so what, what happened there? And he was like, they're good. They're probably not for my studio, but we still accepted them. And I was like, what do you mean? And it's like, and he said, basically like, he's going to do well wherever he goes, but based on what I, what I heard, he might be better at these other schools. So mm. like, that's why I spoke to him and said, like, even though you're going, like you could go here, I strongly recommend you don't because there's like so like and he explicitly said like this is where I think you could thrive in and I know you didn't apply to the school before but try it see what happens and like he came to me pissed because he's like I can't believe somebody would say that and it's like well I mean they didn't give you any money <laughs> and when you applied to the other school in question you got in on full scholarship so they really you wanted wrong? you <laughs> yeah or it's like like schools want people for different reasons i think that's something that we like we as people like within academia or like arguing like certain aspects of academics and like i think it's an okay thing to admit that like you could go to harvard and just be a number or you can go to another institution and not only thrive there but that the connections to get into the field that you want to Instead of having to be forced to say, like, as a Harvard graduate, as a Harvard graduate, as a Harvard graduate, it's like, okay, there's a bunch of Harvard graduates. So if you actually, if anybody asked me, okay, to give, given the choice, could I have gone to any other school, any Ivy League, whatnot, or any school around the world, I would have said no. The reason why is because the connections that I did make in the state school that I did go to, the friends that were able to make the experiences that I had, I feel like that is priceless and n- right. no amount of like, okay, Harvard, it's just a name. It- it's just a brand to me, actually. I-, I wouldn't give up that. Even if there are benefits to flexing that brand on the resume or to employers or to like, e- even like other people, friends and family and whatnot. Yeah. And what makes certain stereotypes about academic achievement so nefarious for me is that there is an understanding because there is a level of truth there, a small level of truth that if you go to certain levels of schools or certain schools, that brand could get you into places that you wouldn't be able to get into otherwise. Mm -hmm. And there is a level of truth to that. But then what happens is there's this like, stereotypical affirmation of like you have to do these things and like we know it's nonsense but then like you'll you'll hear that type of language like permeate even down to the parent level and it's like hang on like that's not quite correct and then nobody i don't say nobody tries to address it but it's a really sensitive topic to address for people in many cases, it's actually become toxic. So going back to the model minority of Asians, they're smart, they're going to do well, they become doctors, engineers, and they're going to go into the STEM fields, and they're good at math, for example. That puts a lot of pressure on Asians to actually like try to achieve that because they hear all these 
objectives, the objectification of them, and they're like, I don't want to disappoint people. I don't want to disappoint society. In some cases, I don't want to disappoint my family. So, for example, myself, uh, I study the social sciences. I didn't go into STEM. I'm not that stere- I'm not good at math. I'm not that stereotypical Asian that's going to become a doctor or an engineer. Um, and it, it actually turns out that most Asians who go to college study business management. And then the second most is social sciences and humanities. It's only the third most that actually go into STEM. And so then there's this also this model minority, it, uh, um, not just like the status, but also uh, this prejudice on what we're supposed to be and what are is to be expected of us. And this is like permeated, not just like in popular culture, but what we've, what we're talking about here in our political debates. Yeah. And then what's funny is that you'll see, like, I, I'm sure you probably noticed this too, but one of the things that came from sort of the, the stop Asian hate um, movement as like, not only a social movement, but a political movement is that there has been an incredible like representation of all different types of the Asian diaspora in film and media. And then it's like, it's a, and then it's like, wait a minute, if Asian Americans are supposed to be in, like succeeding in these STEM fields, why is there disproportionate representation, not disproportionate representation, but why is there like a, an outpouring of like acknowledgement of like, actually there's a lot of Asian Americans in the arts and the arts are great and a totally fine field to go into. Like both of those truths can't, like there they are to an extent like they're co they're trying to coexist at the same time mm-hmm. when in reality where it's like some people might even feel like well i can't like do how do i say this the fulfillment of the stereotype would be like okay there is this representation and that's fine but i can't go in that field there's no money in that field there's no way of like like looking good to myself or my family in that field and it's like wait no it, there totally is but <laughs> there's like there's different ways of doing that. That isn't just exclusively ending up in Hollywood, you know? Yeah. I actually did experience that in, in a lot of ways. Uh, my family has, is disappointed that I didn't go into STEM because they argue that's where the money is. And they <sighs> they would also argue that, well, if you want to live and want to live well, you go for the money. And th- this also does link back to a, a little bit of, what I would consider a a cultural aspect in that at least in like Chinese Confucius uh, from that perspective uh, we're kind of labeled as or seen as servants people who are not who do not belong in power we do not belong in politics and controlling because that's in America that's a white man's job You, you you don't go to that because you're just going to fail and in, in actually a lot of ways, in terms of like our democracy, uh, in which the, the majority of people are white and uh, there is identity politics in which people link themselves to a person, not because of their politics, but because of who they are, then it's going to be really difficult. And I have and I constantly have to say, I'm not trying to be a, become a politician. I just want to study politics. <laughs> Yeah, it's a yeah. different thing. <laughs> yeah, and and then because the thing is too, and this is something that I have been sort of struggling with is because we kind of saw it with um, the hopeful confirmation of Katashi Jackson Brown, where it just kind of felt like black liberalism was on trial because, like, even in her arguments about that whole child porn back and forth, like one part of her argumentation that was really interesting to me is that every time that there was a criticism about her sentencing, there was a catering to the system as a means of that justification of why she did that. And, and it would be like, she would say something, I'm going to sort of like, I'm paraphrasing here where she would say something like, well, this is what I would want to do, but because of the statue and because of the precedent, I am bound to these restrictions. And then it's like, okay. And my mind goes like, so she's 
not a threat to being, or she's not tough on crime then, or sorry, soft on crime, because there's still an adherence to like the systems that are behind her. Where if she was like this leftist, far left judge, she would say like, I don't care about the precedent. Like the precedent is wrong in this case. And because I'm the judge, like here's my arguments as to why they're wrong. So this is why I did this thing. But you never heard that in her argument. And I think that's because to an extent, um, racialized groups or racial, like whether it be black people, Asian people, indigenous folks, like anybody who's non-white, there's a question of like, okay, how much of, the potential shared identity that I have with my racialized group, do I need to discard as a means of staying in this position? Because I don't think you can go extremely left um, as a judge, as a lawyer, as a politician to an extent, like there's some restrictions there. And the question is like, are you better served outside of the system or within it? And I'm saying outside, that means people who are like political commentators, political analysts, journalists, or do you just become a politician and then hope that you don't end up being Nancy Pelosi in 50 years? <laughs> and it's like, mm -hmm. because like I hear how people talk about Nancy Pelosi when she first came in. Like there's like this sort of like, I remember when she was so pretty back then. And then it's like, oh God, is this going to happen to AOC? We're all just going to be in rocking chairs talking about how pretty she was dancing in videos in college and how oh, she, was she was very was a progressive. Bartender. Oh. <laughs> yeah. She was very progressive back then too. I don't know what happened. And it's like, well, maybe the system is what happened. Mm -hmm. and but anyway, that's a digression. You, you know me. I'm that liberal. I'm not that like far left. I want to burn everything down, rebuild yeah. it. Uh-huh. But it, it doesn't it also it doesn't take a lot for me to be like, yeah, race does matter. There is systemic effect. This yeah. model minority myth and arguments are complete BS and it it actually it hurts the group more than it actually benefits uh them as well so that's i i i'm that liberal you don't yeah. you don't need to be like so woke and so far left in order to understand that hey this these are factors that we have to consider that we have to recognize if we want mm -hmm. to solve a problem well, something to to that as well, because I had been admittedly very antagonistic to liberals as of late, and even like my arguments and frustrations dove come some stem from liberalism. Like something that I try to explain, like even when I talk about liberals now, is that it's a very particular aspect of liberalism that I'm very frustrated about, mm -hmm. and even that aspect to an extent is still like a character in the political compass, where like this character does exist of individuals who are like willing to like i'm going to like the language of like reaching across the aisle to conservatives and saying like well so they have some good points here and there and how can we use these good points to to come together but for race it's like i don't what what's the good point <laughs> like, um and sometimes what happens is um and this is always like my concern is that a lot of the concessions that i believe that certain racial groups have in terms of within society are not that far from what the social consensus is where it's like, Hey, we should probably do something about police. Right. And it's like, sure. And then we can disagree about what that looks like. But then there are some people who are just like, no, we need to protect law enforcement at all costs. And it's like, we already do that. So <laughs> they have a union, they have the, the policies and procedures underneath them. And then they have like a chain of command that's willing to defend anybody, no matter what. Yeah. But then when it comes to understanding your understanding of the model minority, I don't think you and I are that far away on that. Like, I don't think no. you would be, I don't think you're an extremist on that. And I think there are extremists on that. On the other side of people who on like, say like white people who believe that the model minority Asians, race doesn't matter i'm i'm sure there's probably and I, actually i want to ask you this do you think there are black people out there who see asians as the model minority and actually group them together with white people as equivalents yeah i this is kind of where um white supremacy comes in into it for me where there is a frustration within black communities of how other racialized groups have received attention 
mm-hmm. legislatively and also socially. And then what happens is like I see those strifes on Twitter. <laughs> like and what sucks is that like I I'm using Twitter here as a character, but there are people who air their grievances online about these things where it's like okay, Asian Americans were able to get a acknowledgement. I think it was in um god, I I can visualize him. He's a very heavy set governor. Um He's like he's from a Midwest state. I'm forgetting his name will come back to me shortly. But he his state passed um, a bill that explicitly teaches about Asian American history in public schools and makes it and mandates it. it's mandatory. And then like you see Black Americans at the time when that passed, I saw them frustrated. Where it's like, oh, so Asian Americans get <laughs> the thing that we wanted, which is like a a like front and center approach to the education of a racialized group in public schools, but black Americans are getting antagonized by CRT and nobody's saying anything. And then mm. like that, if you if that frustration doesn't get addressed, then you will get um, people who will say off putting things about Asian Americans, off putting things about Muslim Americans, off putting things about um, a- Asian Americans, especially Asian Americans in urban centers and, and more Southern areas because then there's like a whole other cultural thing that's happening there um and you get those frustrations where i believe there's a there's a truth to the frustration but then the myth like the idea of like what an asian american looks like that racialized character of what asian american looks like gets perpetuated in a way that does not lead to things that i believe to be desirable yeah so then uh they're not desirable so then like uh what is one way that you would think to in order to to mend that divide because i i think like Mm. when it comes to the topic of race and maybe this is like my liberal position i don't know how you feel about this but it's it's a top it's an issue of that requires for us to all be together yeah yeah i believe that like i guess in terms of like my political position (laughs) is that i think that integrated communities are better than segregated communities but there still needs to be conversations within those racialized groups about what's going on with them and then with like the broader public at the same time so that's why i think affinity groups are really important because the way that black americans talk about other racialized groups i think there needs to be explored about about that within that racialized group but that doesn't mean they shouldn't exclusively talk about that where it's like something that i think is important is for members of historically oppressed groups coming together and talking about their experiences with these systems how these relationships differ from one to another but there has to be i think a very and this is like step one like a conscious understanding that because of the relationships we have there's going to be some language you are not going to agree with (laughs) from the jump. And you have to always like keep that in your head at all times where like you might have a, you might, you might have Lily Chen who has a doctorate degree in economics and is looks like a totally nice, well-intentioned person say some really weird shit about black people. And you're going to have to let that fly and let that exist in the air simultaneously You'll see Kanisha say some pretty ridiculous things about Asian Americans, and they have to sit in the air and understand, like, okay, do these sentiments exist from these people because they have they hold hate in their heart, or is this just a collection of their their personal relationships with these systems, and then there's no other way of expressing it otherwise, like. For like one thing that I guess to kind of like really center this for somebody who might be watching this now or later that doesn't kind of understand what I'm saying is let's say you are an Asian American and if your teachers are white, the people who handle your money are white, the people who you bought your home, who who like sold your home to you and now are selling your current home are white and the politicians representing you are white. Like, would you believe that this is a system that is designed for you if that's what you see your entire i want to say designed for you but like a system that represents you or could represent you your entire life it's possible but at the same time if those systems give you negative a- outcomes or, or negative aspects and those are the only type of people you see who do you blame like who's to blame there and i want to take it away from the individual 
where it's like these things are going to function in a way regardless of what face you put in front of it Mm -hmm. so how do we adjust these things for the better like it's not white people by and large that i blame for white supremacy white supremacy in my opinion will function even if you had an all black electorate or an all sorry excuse me an all black legislature if the system like if the policies practice policies and procedures don't change it doesn't matter who you put in front of it it's gonna do the, it's gonna continue the exact same thing yeah like when people say oh obama got elected as president okay racism over woohoo celebration here's the pop, pop. <laughs> yeah. right yeah Mm. And I'm like to be to be clear, there's something to say about representation because it shows that like there is value to that. Where it's like, okay, that could be me, there. That could be me as president. That could be me as vice president. But it's more. It's deeper than just having it be you. Because if this just like, if you want somebody to change your community for the better, and they are say a Muslim American. And you're like, yeah, we finally have a Muslim American in office. Maybe she's going to hear the strifes of what we have as, as Muslim people. And then they just don't do anything for eight years. It's like, well, what did the representation do? It got you the point to celebrate, but what are we celebrating for? You know? Yeah, nothing objective at the end came about that actually helped your group. Yeah. So something that you did mention before kind of did remind me of critical race theory and one of its prescriptions, which is, well, how we deal with racial issues is by coming together, expressing our views and our experiences and trying to get at like some sort of an understanding. That might be like a very liberal way of pointing at that, but sure. it, it felt like you were that's what you were trying to do on that panel. But because of, as you said, like, hey, sometimes you just got to hear like some uncomfortable things or um, maybe your interpretation is not what the presenter was trying to make it out to be. That wasn't their attention. But then still, there's like maybe some sort of a taboo on like, oh, you can't say that because um, and like that might be a colorblind thing. But what really struck me is that there was kind of a woke backlash to it in which they were trying to reject you in what you were trying to express. And that also like goes against, I I would say like what you were saying is the prescription of CRT. Yeah. Like something that I found very interesting and this happens a lot on panels. There's sort of two truths at the same time. There are people who have very black extreme views that are on the internet and interacting with the public online like that like that is explicitly true and anybody tells you otherwise they're they're not online enough but at the same time there are member whether it be black americans asian americans latino americans um there are those member different members of racialized groups that have frustrations with the system and are not going to express themselves in a way that makes people comfortable and something that i think is is tough for a lot of people especially those who are kind of coming to terms with what race is certain phrases are are kind of taboo like saying that somebody is white or even in this case white presenting like even though it's not what i meant to to say to kenny is something that like is going to rub people a very weird way yeah because it's like well racialized groups can't be white and it's like i know that's part of my argument where it's like, even if like, like for example, an Asian American, for example, right. Can adopt every single trait that we deem to be American and and white Mm -hmm. tomorrow. And their racialization will never, they can never escape that. And to reject that is going to come with a lot of consequences, but you'll never be identified as white in the United States because it's just not designed for that. However, something that is happening And this is my biggest frustration is that for white Americans, there is an allowance to have the ability to present in different ways from other racialized groups with limited to, I would argue, no consequence. (laughs) And like a good example to that of most recent um, in terms of like our identifiers is Aquafina. Uh, something that she ended up going on the trial for for the past couple of months is her her use of black scent. And then when met with the question of like, okay, what are you going to do about 
not only like the media perpetuating you to do this thing, but you as an Asian American, she did the conversations argument of like, these are important conversations we must have. And we have, and then like every single black Americans. And I think for, for some Asian Americans, you were just like, Oh God, don't do this. Like don't die on this hill where it's like, it's what she's saying. Is not bad? But it's not like addressing that, like, hey, for certain racialized groups, they're able to accept certain aspects of what it means to present from other racialized groups. They'll never be members of that group. But when questioned about that presentation of, okay, why are you presenting in this way? And we maybe we can explore that presentation. Mm -hmm. There's no real consequence to it. However, people are quick to, um, and this might be the level of like, there might be a lot to this. And I wish there was like more time to delve with this idea that there is a level of like presenting of Asians. That's just unacceptable at all times. Where like, we kind of deem that like that level of like act, the level of like an Asian accent or different levels of like adopting, whether it be clothes or even do- adopting certain like aspects of like how you look is just something you should not do at all times. And it's just it's it's been interesting to me in that regard. Um, I'm I'm trying to think if there is a line that I would draw in terms of like other groups trying to maybe, uh, what's that word when? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, appropriate, like appropriate yeah. in my culture, or um, I'll have to think about that. But I, when you mentioned Aquafina, hmm, I think we're thinking of the same person. It's the actress, right? Yeah, She's been in a bunch of Marvel movies, Crazy Rich Asians. Yeah, she was. Um, and then she played the. <laughs> I hate that this is a stereotype. It's a caricature of the eight a- um, Asian American outsider to mm-hmm. Asian culture. So to um, Asian culture, and that's an um the movie I I'm totally thinking of get a song. That. Yeah, I'm, the the movie I'm talking about for those who are watching is called Song Chi. Um, and she plays a character that is divorced from what what um her chinese culture is and throughout the film she's learning her not only like her culture as an as a like her identity as a person but then how it relates with other people and then like the whole time i'm watching this movie i go like why is this still a trope in 2022 like why is this still a character um because it's like to me it's like kind of frustrating where it's like yes people from racialized groups as Americans are going to struggle with their identity. And, um, and I will admit just, and, and this is anecdotally from my students, there is, and also talking with other uh, transracial adoptees, like transracial adoptees who are Asian get a, get a lot of shit <laughs> to no fault of their own, where it's like, they'll, they'll be in a predominantly um, Asian space, whether that be Chinese, Japanese, korean philippine or otherwise but like pete like I, i've seen the faces some of my adopt these students get when they introduce themselves to the public it's like what like you're you're korean are you, you sure and it's like oh. <laughs> like i did a i did an adoptee round table um and a lot of them are predominantly of chinese descent and some of the questions that the audience had were wild <laughs> like um because like one one woman that really like jumped out to me she was very frustrated at this reoccurring theme that all these um chinese adoptees did not have any acknowledgement to look back to their birth culture as being from china and then one of my students said like i don't know what it means to be chinese but I do identify that I am a Chinese American. And there were, it was like, I felt like I was in Mori when she said that because there were like <laughs> audible groans. <laughs> and, and, and what sucks about that is that if you're hearing that for the first time, I could totally see that to be jarring. But in America, if you are adopted into a family that's outside of your birth culture, there's going to be a level of discarding that might exist. Mm-hmm. And then you'll get a very confused individual who it sounds like the, the cliche, like not white enough for the white spaces, not black enough for the black spaces, but like that has to juggle between that idea of like, 
I present in this way, but because of like my cultural expression, I can't pass within this group of people. Despite the fact that I want to like desperately in some cases connect with my birth culture in this aspect. Mm. I'll, I'll, I might tell you something even crazier than what one of your students said. When I was in kindergarten, I thought I was white. True. I, I thought I was white too. Like, <laughs> I, I literally like, bro, I would, I ask my, I, this is a, this is a memory ingrained into my head. I asked my third grade teacher why, like I'm only white here. And she was not prepared for that question because I went to guidance right after <laughs> like, <laughs> like cause I remember like, cause if I asked that question and I was like, really like, I was just, I was being a kid because she didn't really answer it. I was getting like a little heated about that. Like, no, like, like you, like people say that I'm different, but I'm not different here. Like, why is there a difference? And then she just took me to guidance and then we, and then like my mom got called in, like, and that's like a memory, like grilled into my brain. <laughs> And so that, was that like a, a little bit traumatizing? Um, I think it's trauma. <laughs> I like looking back, like I could definitely see that as like because like again, like I don't have a lot of vivid uh memories when I was younger, but like that one sticks out to me and a couple others. And it's definitely some type of traumatic experience. But I guess it would say traumatic in the regards of that you get reminded that you aren't a member of whatever the dominant identifiable group is very like, it kind of just like whips you back sometimes, um, especially when you're younger. I think for me, that may be like one of the moments that like, it's like, okay, I am different from these other people around me. Mm -hmm. um, and then like, like how a realization. Much... Yeah. Yeah. And the idea, and by the way, that idea of people feeling white, or like believing themselves to be white is a very common occurrence too. Um, and then people like will be like, oh, I don't understand what that means. Like, how do you not believe, how do you, how do you believe yourself not to be white? And it's like, well, I mean, <laughs> like, do you want to go there? <laughs> Cause yeah. that conversation is, is, is messy, you know? Yeah. I think the reason why I believe that to be the case is because I knew what America was yeah. or I had a rough idea. And then looking at, other people i was like yeah I'm, I'm american i'm white like i made that association uh, without and then i think like sometime uh maybe in the third grade something something hit me and it was i came to school wearing uh something my family gave me it was like more on like the chinese side mm -hmm. and then i was taken around to other classrooms oh. to like to like be shown like what i was wearing oh. And, and then I started to realize, okay, actually there's, there's something up here. What's going <laughs> yeah. on? Yeah. And that's, and the funny thing is too, is like you and I, we're not, oh, we are kind of far in age, but we're not far enough in that people were kind of coming to terms with like what they believe, like modern belief or other modern navigations of race. Mm -hmm. And some of it's just like, oh my God, <laughs> oh my God. Where, like, let's say you do have a more, like, traditional expression that's more, like, attached to, say, let's say, like, Chinese culture, for instance, right? And then, like, you, you, you don these expressions, but since they're not in the same context that people normally expect it to be, then it's like, oh, this is so pretty. Like, look at this. Everybody take a look at this. And it's like, okay. Okay, I just chose to wear this today. I don't know what's different about this. Um, because I have a student now where she wears um more traditional um Uganda and excuse me, not Ugandan Jesus, um Kenyan garb and like different like like she wears flip flops to school every day. <laughs> like and it's just what her family wears. And even and like every once in a while, people be like call her like that weird girl that wears gowns and flip flops, and it's like, Ugh! just close. <laughs> yeah, it's just close. It's just close, and she has a Kenyan accent. That's literally it. <laughs> like, um, and it's frustrating because that is an example, I think, of how being American can like 
kind of it's kind of weird it gets a little weird in these parts yeah it clashes um so Mm. then how i was taught and how i understand america is that we're multi-ethnic we're very um tolerant of each other and we're kind of like this melting pot where we're from all over the world and we can be okay into calling ourselves and sharing this identity of being american but then all of a sudden when you have like a a person who is more closer to their origins then we start to question them or when even like say for aquafina who like is so far away from her uh, origin of ethnicity or culture then we also start to question that as well and damn now, now that you mentioned it, it it is like really dividing how or, or maybe like okay how i'm how i'm understanding america to be the melting pot may not be working as well as i want it to be and yeah, I, we I, often call like america the, the great experiment because we're not like the typical nation state where it's one country, one nation, we're, we're multi-nation, we're multinational. Uh, yeah. And then what's funny is that, and this is where I get a little, where I get weird champed on panels, is that there's an acceptance that like America, I'm going to use a Pokemon reference, right? Like America's uh-huh. kind of like the town center of the entire world, where like we're just a collection of a bunch of people of different ethnicities and different locations. And we decided to, some forcefully, <laughs> to come here and figure this out together. And then at the same time, we allowed other people to come come, come over here and figure this out with us. But you got to be good at working mm-hmm. or you, you have to have a really good education. And then it's like, okay, wait, that's a little fucked up. How about it's just anybody? Okay, we'll just accept anybody. And then you get people who say things of like, we need to close off the borders to immigration. We need to like, in different, like restrictive. Yeah. And it's like immigration. I would say is one of the most American aspects of like how it exists today. Like we didn't just start appearing here by happenstance. <laughs> like that, like now if that happened, like, okay, cool. But it's, it's not the case. Like we understand that like we are this like melting pot of different, ethnicities racial identities and stuff like that like to your point but at the same time there's it's like to an extent Mm -hmm. it's like we're a melting pot we enjoy all these cultures until we recognize that english is the primary language (laughs) and but we'll we'll put other languages on it but we're just gonna put mandarin russian and spanish but we're a melting pot like don't forget like it's it's really weird to me um Weird's one way of saying it. Frustrated might be closer. Um, and then like, uh, yeah, it's it's a fun one. This country's a fun one, but yeah. And I actually I sympathize with that. Not just like my experience because I grew up here, I learned English, right? But my mm. parents who came here, they 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 didn't learn English when they were growing up. They had to learn English when they came here. And it's difficult to learn a new language. And so then when even like to this day, when she's trying to do like taxes or some sort of a document for government and whatnot, she needs my help. I need to translate for her whenever we need to talk to, say, like a doctor or dentist or or anything. I have to be there to translate. (laughs) Funny, funny enough, when I was in school and like I had like guidance counselor meetings, I had to be there to tell what my guidance counselor was talking about me to my mom mm. because she didn't understand what my guidance counselor yeah. was saying. And the funny thing is too, is that I forget which school board was it. I was going to cover it on my stream about how of this very problem where community recognized that like, Hey, we have a very high, it was, um, I think it may have been Chinese demographic. Yeah, it was, it was uh, some schools, in California where it's like, we had a very high Chinese demographic in the school district. So we wanted to allocate some of the ESSER funds for COVID specifically for translators for guidance counselors and other extra support staff, because there's like multiple problems of like, how, like, how do you explain something about your child's? um, So like, how do I say this? Like there were situations where there might be something that you want to explain to a parent first before you want to explain to the child. And then like, how do you do that if the child's the translator (laughs) or how do you do that? If there's like, 
an outside party. So they wanted to have staff in house that also functioned in other educational capacities, but they were also like one part of their like their expertise is through translation, and they like to be called upon for that. And the school and like the parents like. Whew, they came out hard against that because they were just like they did like ideas like this is the United States and it's up to the school for people to learn English and it's like Ooh. okay <laughs> like it's it's an argument I I don't know how um what's the word equitable that argument is but we'll we'll work with it I guess um they ended up adopting the policy anyway but at the same time it's like it's really interesting how these things kind of like clash with each other. Like even with my girlfriend, um, her mother does not know English at all. She just knows Urdu and she's had two kids. And like, let me rephrase that. Like my girlfriend is the first, it's technically a first generation. Like her and her sister are both first generation immigrants, but she's the first one like born in America. Yeah. And she, I asked her sometime. Yeah. Like I asked her like, how, 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 (laughs) <laughs> just like because she walked into a school experience not learning english at all and i ask her sometimes like how did you like like how and she's like i just watched a lot of tv and i read a lot of books oh, and it's like yeah and my brain still goes like kind of like that that thinking karen meme of like how does that like why didn't anybody like pick up on that of like hey this person does not know any english and sure, she was an ESL, but I know her ESL teacher. Her ESL teacher didn't know Urdu. So it's like, what, what, like, what did you do? Um, and then she was like, said, I was like, yeah, I just like kind of powered through it. And on one hand, people might think of that to be like a courageous story of how a, a Pakistani immigrant like embraced America and like moved it up. And then she's like, nah, that was bullshit. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it, it was bullshit. I have my own uh-huh. ESL st- uh, story in that. Yeah. Oh Lord. <laughs> uh, I, I was in the program in elementary school and then suddenly they decided the school, Hey, you don't need it anymore. So I don't have to take any more ESL classes. But then every single year I got this document in the mailbox saying, hey, we have to, like, do some sort of review. And I'm just like, bruh, I haven't been in ELCL in, like, five years. Like, I'll be junior year in high school taking, like, AP English, advanced placement English classes. And I'm still getting this letter about, oh, it's time for your ESL review. Sign here, send it here. I'm just like, bruh, what what are you doing? What's going on here? Yeah. And and that's, like, something and kind of why... um one of my i guess like thoughts i'm working on a video right now on this idea of identity and like i guess kind of like i'm really trying to make sure i'm a, i'm ahead on this press tour of my my take on hippy dippy and that like there is something to how you present modernly in the united states and there are parts that you accept and parts that you discard and for a lot of first generation immigrants and a lot of just immigrants broadly in the United States, that's a choice you have to make very early. Mm-hmm. And a part of that, and something that I'm kind of interested in, is that are you doing it as a means of you love America so much, or are you doing it as a means that like you have no other choice in the matter? Because like if you only know, say, Portuguese, what value, and you come from, say, Brazil... Like, what value do you have of preserving Portuguese in an American landscape? Like, that's your language, and that's the language of your people, but do you keep that? And, like, what's the value in keeping that? And America always challenges you to, to ask that, like, to answer that question. And it's kind of bizarre. Yeah, <laughs> um, and that's the system at play, in that yeah. the system determines what are good things to have what are bad things to have and incentivizes you to move towards that like as you said what good is it to only know portuguese in por- por- portuguese blah, yeah. in the united yeah, yeah. states that's like everything you're going to be have to do is in english dominantly so yeah in some ways whether you like it or not for the benefit of living for having a, a good life and having an easy life probably uh put portuguese on the side and learn english Mm. So then, like, something for me, and 
in, in which like i've actually been accused of like getting indoctrinated into this because like born in america love america went through the education system they taught me this yeah. history oh the constitution liberalism oh it's it's, it's mm. all nice and stuff and then i'll have arguments with uh, my family members or uh or even like my parents on yeah hey uh, I'll mention like, oh, China. China's doing bad things. I don't like what China is doing. And they'd be like, "That's that's your that's your country of origin. How can you say that? You've been brainwashed by the American education system." And I'm just like, <laughs> and I'm just like, hold on, okay, you're the one who told me to study hard. <laughs> you're the one who told me to get good grades. Yeah, like to that, which we've kind of seen in real time with um oh god <laughs> what's going on like in the genocide bad woo woo woo, woo discourse is that there is a level like so god here we go there's a level of truth in that like westernized like media is always going to have a level of dilution because like you're not going to get like how it like west like american media isn't going to go as far as media from like the country of origin like that much is true but then the question is, like, this isn't that the same way that other countries are navigating? And then it gets really weird in interactions. Like, I mean, we, we saw it in real time on Twitch where you had people, like, denying genocide. And then at the same time, you had people where it's like, oh, God. And I think that comes with the relationships that you have with these countries, too. Because there are people, because um, some of my friends are from Ukraine, and they don't like Zelensky at all. And I don't understand it. Like, I'm still trying to figure out that conflict. I'm still, like, somewhere in the 2000s of, like, reading up and catching up. But then, like, they're, like, openly telling me in private, um, well, not private, let me, let me rephrase that, private that ends up in public discourse of, like, yeah, Zelensky sucks. And the people, and, like, you see Americans, like, what how could you Zelensky? how da how dare you like how could you say that to, what think about the ukrainian people and it's like yeah i'm from ukraine so and, and it's like okay there's some complication even and, and that's and what's funny is that in america that's kind of just accepted like it's like yeah trump sucks okay nice. nothing happened all right nice uh biden sucks all right. Okay, little mummerings here and there, but uh, okay. And then, like, you go to other countries, or not really other countries, but there's like a now, like, sort of like Americanized analysis of situations where it's like, you cannot, how dare you say this thing about X individual or Y individual? It's not as bad, mind you. Like, it's not as like, it's controversial. To to, yeah. Yeah. It's like, it tends to be, yeah, generally controversial, which is, again, I think how, like, <sighs> how identity interacts with it. Like where I guess to the point I'm trying to make here, sorry, is that there's like sort of three things at play that I've kind of identified. There's the social, the socialization of your identity, the politicalization of your identity. And then this third aspect that I haven't been able to like, kind of like put into like a definition, but just of how like you perceive that. And like that struggle between those two. So it's like what you observe, what you observe from a social environment, whether it be like how people affirm you to be, there's how the political aspect affirms you to be. And then there's like you and the, con the confliction between those two things. Um, because like if you spend your whole life believing yourself to be, say, white, for instance, and then society affirms you to be white, and then politically, it's like you're actually Hispanic white. And it's like, mm -hmm. wait, what? <laughs> and it's like well i've been checking white on the census my whole life well turns out we have a new categorization for you and it's like okay so i don't check white and it's like well you can if you want and it's like so the census is kind of weird in this hold on the census is the number one way of categorizing groups of people in the world and it's like sure but this is kind of weird right <laughs> like mm -hmm. like every couple of years we affirm well, a couple ten or for us, like we we reaffirm who we are, and then the government keeps track of that for the sake of monitoring groups. But yeah, go yeah. For, sorry. So I, I want some clarifications. Uh, sure. Is the political identity 
also synonymous or related with, say, like biological identity? Hmm. That I'm not exactly sure yet. Mm -hmm. Where I like let me let me pull back. Legally, we made that shit clear. <laughs> like we like, for example, like the whole um idea of the grandfather clause. Like that was explicitly clear of like you're not only affirming it doesn't matter what you are, what your racialization is, because of your grandfather, like what your grandfather was, therefore you're gonna have different levels of restriction. And we're not gonna say black, we're not saying black, but <laughs> we're gonna make it pretty explicitly clear that that's what we mean. Where at the same time, it's like, I think now what we're seeing is there is a small hint of that, like a small hint of like, biological confirmation but at the same time i don't think it's a, it properly encapsulates what is happening this is why i hate the census by the way <laughs> where like we're going to be very and we're already seeing it where like people who identify with one or more with one or more races is becoming a demographic that they have to track but then like why are we tracking it like, what is the purpose of tracking it? Or like, and that's something even in, in digging through census data, like then census, like what, what do they call those people? Like, uh, I forget the name of it, but like people who track, like track that data and analyze mm -hmm. it. Like, I don't know, like they're not even giving me answers that like help me encapsulate why they're doing this of like, I understand there's like an importance of it, right? Like monitoring, like how people are evolving over time. But like, it's like, for me, it's like, what's the social reason we're doing this? What's the political reason why we're doing this? And what does it mean in terms of like tracking groups broadly in the United States? You know, I don't know if that answers that question. Yeah. So an example to kind of just further expand on your point sure. is what you brought up in. There's a, a Chinese person who was adopted by white people and um, on the census, they they probably have to check legally that they're Asian, but they don't they don't have any connection to Asian culture or the, their their origin of, of of country, and so then like socially, yeah, what does that mean? It it, it actually there's no social value there, and yeah. this this kind of goes back to uh to like this this point of hey, there's these um like rich Asian people, but then, yeah, what do they actually have to do culturally to themselves in order to get there? And that is, huh, like, like man, even, even for me, what, what did I have to do? Um, and I think I, I really appreciate that my parents were the ones who came from, who were the, they, they immigrated here. So yeah. I, I'm getting taught a lot about my culture, a lot from, my parents, my family, uh, as well as even my school, because uh, my school was one of the first schools to have a Chinese language program. Mm. And I was able to continue that even in college, learning uh, more Chinese there. It was easy, easy A, nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And, huh. What well, did, I guess what, like... What did I have to discard? Yeah, I, I would say to to maybe the kind of like re I'm not reinforce but maybe help simulate some thought here and kind of like what I'm trying to knock at is that there is like value in affirming who you are like that's always like a level like that's not like I'm not trying to make that like, make it sound like it's unimportant but the way that we categorize people I think constantly challenges that but we're never put in a position to really like a answer that question objectively mm -hmm. because like I was in a world where I didn't grow up around white people, or excuse me, black people. I had very few black people in my life. I have none in my family. So my mother is white, my father is white, and they're German Irish. And I was raised Roman Catholic. My mom didn't really introduce me to anything of what it meant to be part of like the African diaspora or even what it meant to like be black. So it's like, why would I check? in terms of the census, why would I check black and why would I check white? And I think there are decent arguments, I think, to check either one of those two boxes. But then at the same time, like I think there's also an argument 
to check two or more races because like what is race functioning on mm-hmm. the census and they say like oh so to determine like political seats and stuff like that and it's like okay but why are we tracking racialized groups when we know these categorizations are very flimsy um and then on top of that <laughs> it's like maybe asking more questions about our relationship based on our categorization. So like a question that I really want the census to add, and I write complaints to them when when they allow for open comment of like asking the question outright of like, what do you affirm your identity to be? Whether it be your sex, um, gender, race, and then like what does society affirm you to be? Mm Mm-hmm. Because I think that might be able to open a door to like different observations. Um, but we wouldn't, then, be, uh, we wouldn't be the ones choosing that. Society chooses that. Right. But like, I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that, like, let's say you are, I'll use, um, what's his, God, what's his name? Um, I'm trying to think of something that like people, a person will know. Like, um, Logic. I forget his like legal name. But like, let's say Logic has a question of like, hey, what do you affirm yourself to be? And if he looks at that and goes, I affirm myself to be black check. And then another question is like, what do you believe society perceives you to be? And then that might be a question, an answer where he might check like black, white and other races. And it's like, okay, there's something to that. Like why is society and your observation affirming you to be this? And how does that influence your relationship not only in society, but in other political systems. Mm -hmm. Because like, if you get a, like if logic is black on his driver's license and then he gets pulled over by a police officer and the police officer just looks at this and looks at him and then says like, your ID is fake. And it's like, how are you saying my ID is fake? Say, well, it says black here on your ID. And it's like, well, I am black. And it's like, okay, step out of the car. <laughs> it's like, you know what I mean? Like, cause that can, that could happen. Like, I'm not saying like that's going to happen. That's happened to logic before. I was like, that's something that is a possibility in our, our current identifications of race and how kind of flimsy they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, but to just flip back the question that in the sure. criticism that you had on the census, what is the purpose of asking what you want to add on the census, which is like, what, what do you think society perceives you to be? What is the purpose? Oh, of that? because I think that the way that society perceives us in a way can influence how they respond to us when we're interacting with different um, systems. So I'm saying systems, I'm mainly saying like the big three society, like just ordinary people, education and politics. Mm -hmm. So like you'll have like different um, ways that society outputs towards you because they might believe you to be of something. So like a question that might sort of expand on this that may exist in the census, which then this gets really dicey because of different narratives politically of like, have you felt discrimination because of your gender? And because of what people affirm your gender to be. And for some people, that answer, as we've seen in Bills in Utah, might be explicitly yes. And then, like, you can expand on it. Okay, like, why do you believe that this is happening? And then, like, that thing is, uh, requires a bit more, like, participation in the census. But I think it would help in terms of, like, at least in my opinion, of understanding better how people are navigating in society in different ways, especially in terms of discrimination. Because like, if there's a group that believes that they're being discriminated on the basis of their skin tone, and then within the census, you can like look at say like, okay, this demographic, like let's say we'll see black people, black people believe that there's discrimination in law enforcement. And then like, based on the census data, we found disproportionately that black Americans, when asked mm-hmm. the question that they believe to be pers- like, discriminated on based on the, the color of their skin they they wrote like yes so like okay how and then like how do we investigate that a level further um because i think to for the most part analyzing problems in the world i think requires a lot of questions yep 
to really like pinpoint down what we're talking about. Because I think that there is a level of value and conservatives kind of get this part right, asterisk and fine print, of like saying like, what is racism? And it's like, okay, that's a good question, but the answer you get might lead to more questions. But don't get upset that it leads to more questions. Just ask them. <laughs> like, because it's if you good don't, that we have more questions. Yeah, yeah. Because like, it, we're not talking about like, what's a pencil? <laughs> like, we're trying to figure out like these really like difficult things in the world for a means of trying to do better by others. I think that's what what like all policies are trying to do and like practice policies and procedures trying to do well by others. Um, and the question that's going to require some questions um, and deeper investigation. Now, in terms of the census to answer that question a little bit more directly, I would say that it's going to be tough because in a vacuum, just asking specifically what society perceives you as doesn't really do much. Yeah. Cause like that singular question doesn't have a lot of utility. Like it would be, it would have utility if we're trying to see how it relates with other things. So it's like, if you believe, cause I could see a world where you, a black American could not see or didn't perceive any discrimination based on the color of their skin and education, but maybe it happens. Or they believe it to happen in politics or like in like political systems with the be through the law and stuff like that. And those are two different conversations. Um, and maybe the census could be a vehicle for that. I I don't know. <laughs> um, I would say I just probably not. Yeah, like I but went to school I, for music, so but yeah, like it's a it's a good research question for say like mm -hmm. public opinion polls. Yes, or surveys. I think that's really useful. And if, if anything, if not, then it's really useful for self introspection. Like think about who you are, what you are, how does that relate to society. And I, I think those are like really important. It's not just for understanding, yeah, who we are, but what what is our what is our relationship? Like we have to we have to in order to get to those answers, we have to ask those questions, right? Yeah, yeah. And do you think that I guess to ask you a question? Um, how do you feel? Because this is like something that's been on my mind. Like, how do you feel about um, the adoption? that white Americans have to different aspects of whether it be, we'll say, I'll say Asian culture broadly, or just what we've been seeing in the past couple of years where it's like, you'll every once in a while you'll see, for instance, the more um, quote unquote Asian prom dress. And then, mm -hmm. then there's just the diaspora wars all over again on this poor, like unsuspecting 17 year old white girl who just thought the dress looked pretty um, stuff like that. It doesn't be exclusive I, to dress, by the way. I yeah, I personally don't have a problem with the dress. It and are there like other things that um, that piss me off? A good example that comes to mind in film is the Mandarin character in Iron Man oh, three, three, yeah. two, two, three. <laughs> three. <laughs> um, Iron Man two was uh, Whiplash. Yeah, Iron Man three was the Mandarin. Yeah, mm -hmm. and because something that not to not to bias this too much, but something that I'm always kind of like, it it just rubs me very weird. Of like, why are we using aspects of say Chinese culture, Japanese culture, and Korean culture to envision what certain characters look like and how they express themselves, like? Does the man like like what's the utility in that? Because um, and again, like this is this is comics and and media, and it's not supposed to make sense. It's not supposed to like, but at the same time, it's like there is some level of commentary that they're trying to portray. Mm -hmm. Uh, when Iron Man three first came out, I did find that to be weird, and like even in the comics, the Mandarin villain was of I, I believe Chinese origin. I I'm not a <laughs> comic nerd so i i i'm not confident in that but yeah. marvel did eventually save themselves with saying chi because they feel, feel they feel the plot hole is like oh this is actually the real real mandarin and what happened in iron man 3 was just uh was just, was just an actor 
Right. And um, and then that actor became a uh, comedic comedic relief that was really good in Shang Chi. Yeah. And uh, Shang Chi did. Uh oh, I, I enjoyed Shang Chi. Uh huh. Yeah, I did too. Like I want to make that clear. Like, but okay. There was actually one thing that rubbed me the wrong way. Uh, there was a movie, I think it was called The Great Wall. Mm, yep. <laughs> in which, like, the, the saviors, like, were, I think were they were European. Mm. Um, but the, the entire army, uh, which was uh, Chinese, uh, they, they were pretty badass. I just saw the trailer. Yeah. Um, there was also some news about Mulong, live-action Mulong. Yeah. Uh, initially, like the script was about like um, like a, a person, a warrior from Europe was was coming in, and um, they were going to be the ones like alongside Mulong doing stuff like that. That rubbed me the wrong way as well. Um, I oh, I think when it comes to like popular culture, that's when it starts to rub me the wrong way. Like when mm. you start portraying Asian women as like sort of these trophies. Or oh, yeah. when you start portraying Asian men as, like, weak, skinny, emasculine. Okay, yes, I'm basically describing myself, okay? These nerds, gamers, shut-ins. Um, or they it... have the uh, – something that knocked to my door. I, I don't – God, this is going to sound like a boomer thing to say. I yeah. don't know how old you are to know about this show in its totality, but Heroes, I think, did a very good job at – it, it was very unapologetic with how they handled the one Japanese character, Hiro Nakamura. And something that I thought was like, looking back, I was like, wow, for 2007, this is like a brave thing to do because an overwhelming majority of his dialogue was Japanese with subtitles. And even in the portrayal and, and articulation with other characters it, within the Japanese diaspora were speaking Japanese. And then you had this one character, his name was Ando, and he spoke English, but he was a very stereotypical, um, kind of what you're describing, of like because they were both sort of like nerdy business individuals, mm -hmm. but Hiro was a comic book nerd who ended up having like other abilities and powers. But what was so interesting is that in all of the evolutions of his character, and because his character had time travel, so he was able to time travel in different ways, but in all of his like portrayals in dark timeline, he ended up speaking English and predominantly speaking English and like the more darker, badder versions of himself or evil versions. But in his like the character that we knew from the show, he was speaking Japanese from front to back. Like I th even think in the series, like he never really learned English <laughs> where like he did have, like he was able to say like certain things and say certain things, but he kept he like who he was as a Japanese. And I wouldn't even say a Japanese American because he never was an American. He was from Japan and just navigating the United States in different capacities. But I always found that interesting because so often, um, you'll see like that portrayal of like the the asian nerd or you'll get like the farther end of that like the hyper conservative um asian the hyper conservative asian american almost anti-hero that due to some level of loss of their culture or otherwise that they're just kind of cracking down and very singular minded on an issue or I'm going to say like singular minded of like, I'm going to do this no matter what. And like, don't you want this for the sake of our family type of thing? And, that, and again, like this is saying she's spoiler, but it's like, you should probably watch it by now because that was the one thing about that one antagonist. that was really like rubbing me the wrong way of like, they're using like magic as a way to, to say that like this man's being manipulated. And this is why like he's, he's sure there's like legitimate grief there but that grief is being manipulated and that now it's tainting him evil. And it's like, uh, sure. Oh. <laughs> like, can you elaborate more why that rubbed you the wrong way? Because that didn't. Yeah. It, it, I see it a lot in, in media of like racialized member, members of racialized groups that their trauma is genuine, but it's being manipulated for nefarious means. Mm -hmm. Um, like an example of that, like and then using because Marvel does this a lot, like um Black Widow comes to mind for me. 
um uh Luke Cage pretty much every villain <laughs> in Marvel has some level of like trauma that they're using and then like for some of them on the farther end it's like using like a magical aspect mm-hmm. um it's a motivation I think that may, yeah I think that's where it frustrates me if like magic as a means of motivating a like racially identifiable Asian antagonists and protagonists like there's always some level of magic and it's like uh, and I don't and the, and the thing is too is that like so I want to make it clear, like, it's not, like, bothering me enough where I'm, like, I can't watch it. It's, like, a part of me is always, like, this feels weird. I don't know where, <laughs> but um, kind of like where, like, every single black person that's portrayed in, like, World War II films. Mm-hmm. There, there's always, like, a level of, like, black organized crime that is, is expressed. And it's never, like, it's never just, like, just ordinary black people. It's always just, like, some black criminal. And they're all part of some, like, deeper syndicate. And they're go- waging war with the Italians for whatever reason. Um, I, get then, I, I, I get more of what you're trying to get at, um, yeah. which is that in a lot of traditional villains, say, who are, they come, they're, they're more f- for white people. My God. Okay. Yeah. Cancel, cancel me. Uh, the, their <laughs> motivations are more, like more material. They're just like, oh, they want more power. They want... Uh, more wealth, or they have like this master plan of destroying the world, or like controlling people, and, and all these things. But then when it comes to villains that are like w- more oriental, then yeah, they bring a magic, and uh, and like this the supernatural kind of a kind of like it's like it makes it more foreign, and yeah, it, it, like yeah. It, in a way, it's like it explains something that we don't get. Because it's we're like so different in appearances, maybe. Mm. Yeah, these are interesting and questions. Do you have more? Yeah, no, I just like it's just one of the things that I think um, has been on my mind of like how do people? Because I think media can kind of like give the litmus to like do the temperature check of what's going on around us, mm-hmm. or I think the media directly reflects of like to an extent what's going on socially and culturally. And something that I'm getting really sensitive about, this might sound like a weird take, but why can't members of racialized groups just be heroes and just be villains? That there isn't any type of like stereotypical motivation as to why they're, they're doing the thing that they're doing. Um, And it's better now. Like we're beyond the point of Mulan, but or beyond the point of Aladdin. Like we're far beyond that. I, I think but it's this still permeates every once in a while. Uh, and sometimes it's very like overt, like the wall or the last samurai, um, that Tom Cruise movie. Oh Lord. Um, or it can be very subtle, like turning red where it's like turning red. I think it's, fan- it's a fantastic f- movie, but I definitely was like, who, who are these stories and media for, you know? Mm hmm where like there are aspects of like say black panther where it's like okay this is clearly made for white people in certain aspect or even like in sang chi where it's like there could be it sounds weird but like there could be farther um analysis or like ret- like sort of viewer introspection about these issues but then it always feels like they're, they they get to that point like the conversation like one that sticks out to me is like the first scene when they're having like breakfast in um the one guy's house it's like th- and like his grandmother is in the room his mother's in the room and then they're kind of like talking about like what are you doing for work and it's like this weird conversation about like work and jobs mm-hmm. and then it's like okay this could go somewhere that might like like be kind of interesting and complicated but for the sake of the film we're just gonna kind of touch it and then move on (laughs) but then we're gonna use that as a motivating factor later (laughs) where like later on like when they're when the they're like the the one dinner scene or them talking about everything that happened over the past few days is supposed to show like well we do have interesting lives and we're doing things that are important and it's like this could hit better if the other stuff was touched harder you know what i mean yeah, it, it's kind of like 
they're getting at a stereotype and using it to highlight something very briefly. And it, it's kind of like maybe a, a, a little bit of flavor, but then, yeah, they, they completely move on for the sake of the plot. Um, I mean, at least for me, I connected to that really well. And yeah. it it didn't need a lot of elaboration or like explanation, but probably for like other people, like when you watched that, did, did were you did you completely understand what was actually going on? I I understand. I only understand it because I deal with it in music a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess to give you a little bit of context is that I like just to kind of like to be clear, a lot of my Asian American students are exceptional musicians. But none of them want to go into music. Stereotypical. So, <laughs> so yeah, and so and then what happens is is that like they'll be really really talented, and then I'll be like, yo, you should like totally go to school for this, man. Like this could be something that could be really special. And then it's like my parents say no because they want me to make money, and it's like yikes. Okay, <laughs> and and then like or I'll, or I'll have a student say something to me along the lines of like oh, I'm just doing this because it looks good on my resume. And yeah. it's like practicing, like this level of dedication for an instrument just for a resume. <laughs> like, and, and again, like people can go into music however they want. I think like music is a, a fantastic way of expressing yourself. And you don't always have to go into the arts to do things, but it's always interesting of the reasons why. Where it, and I never really hear like, I enjoy this, which is why I'm doing this. Or I'm doing this because I I, I want to bring joy to others. Like kind of like sort of cliche moral things. And that's fine. But it's always I every once in a while I get hit with a response of like, I'm only doing this because like I'm I'm doing this for like the GPA or I'm doing this because my parents are telling me to do it. And like for me, it it gets me kind of like sensitive to it because I do see a lot of the consequences of like you have to work hard and you have to do your best Mm -hmm. um because then like something that happens i talk this on my stream a lot where some of my asian american students like respond to adversity in really weird ways and uh, like an example i could give you is that i had a student who had a conflict for a marching band competition in the sat and it wasn't a, it, there wasn't a negotiation of it. It was like, I have to take the SAT this day. And yeah. I can't go to the competition. And I'm like, okay, what time's the SAT? It's like 8 a.m. What time do you think it'll be done? Five. I'm like, okay, well, we don't compete until 8.30. So if you want, like, you can just take your uniform home. Once you're done the SAT, decompress, then just go to the competition. It's a half hour away. And then it's like, okay, let me ask my parents. A couple hours ago, I can't do that. And it's like, why? Because the SAT is that day. It's like, I know that. <laughs> it, but <laughs> I gave you all this, this other context. And then, like, I'll get these phone calls of where of parents of saying, like, making it sound like where I'm kind of getting gaslit, where I'm, like, diminishing the the importance of the sat Mm -hmm. and they'll they'll say some things like this is a very important thing for my child like why are you saying it's not an important thing i'm not saying that i'm saying you can do both (laughs) both are possible (laughs) like you don't have to go to the rehearsal in the morning just go to competition and it's like yeah but i don't and or there'll be like situations where instead of coming forward with a problem there's just powering through it until it's too late to manage and then, like, what happens is, is this weird conversation of, well, I didn't want to tell you because I didn't want to disappoint you. And it's like, I'm not going to be disappointed if you have a problem. Oh, but they do like, that with their parents. Yeah. <laughs> if I got a bad grade on this test, I'm, I'm not telling my parents shit. Yeah, like, I had a kid, I had a kid who made, um, this is a couple of years ago now, I had a kid who made second chair Allstate and was crying. And he kept saying, like, that's not good enough. And like, what do you mean that's not good enough? <laughs> like, you are literally the second chair. You're the second best saxophonist. You're right the next to the first st- chair. You're sitting <laughs> like, in front of the conductor. Everybody like, could still see you. Like, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and and like it took, and that was like a really like weird process of like, because at the time I was like maybe I was like just start. This is years ago at this point, but like I didn't understand that. I didn't understand the idea of like parents being that like incredibly disappointed at an exceptional accomplishment. And then at the same time, like as I'm older now, I realize like okay, that's just one example, but that example isn't the encapsulation of an entire group of people. I think sometimes people like will hear me say something like that and say like, well, that's just because like of the culture of the families. And it's like for some sure, but not for every single family. Um, Oh, this is absolutely true. And uh, if I had to guess, okay, wait, is this your location? Like your state is known. Yeah, I'm Jersey. Okay. Yeah. Jersey. uh Uh-huh. Which is uh, like suburbia, your school. Suburbia and liberal incarnate. We're like, yep. Okay, so, we're it, like... so like that's that's kind of um one of the last points I have to get at um because I'm gonna have to end this unfortunately. Oh, this yeah, was yeah. really fun. Uh, I, yeah, I might, I like I might want to too. talk about this uh more more later. Is that like this is this is not like the experience of all Asian Americans in that like right. there are urban Asian Americans that are more ghetto, and they don't have these expectations on them, um. And th- this is more of like th- the privileged middle class suburbia, study hard, work hard, uh, get a good job, support the family because like we, we immigrated here and like we, we, we love education, like all, all these things. Right. That's that's actually I, I want to say um, that's that's I, I, okay, I, I don't know if that's like a minority or if that's like most or not like it's hard to say. Yeah. And I guess this is a closing thought for me too, is that I get so frustrated when the success of Asian Americans gets platformed in a way at the plight of Asian Americans at the same time. Yeah. Where it's like, I know that these disparities exist. Like nobody, like it's going to sound kind of fucked up, but the more I talk, the more sense I'm going to make. Like, a lot of laundromats in New Jersey are Asian run. Yep. And a lot of them are closed now because of COVID. And I'm like, okay, this is kind of fucked because a lot of them applied for um, different types of business loans and stuff like that. And were rejected because of like, whether it be issues of filing and issues of paperwork. And then like a part of me is like, we should probably address that. And it's like, no, but, but look at all this media. It's so beautiful, right? And it's like, oh my God. Okay. They're doing so <laughs> <Yes>. well. <laughs> yeah, like, yes, the movies are pretty, but we should probably look at the disparities of this racialized group while also acknowledging the good things of the racialized group. Like, we could do both. We could do both. Please do both. Yeah, it's like, okay, the top 10% of Asians, they're doing so well, but the, the rest of the 90%, okay, well... You could be the top ten percent too. You just gotta work <laughs> yeah, hard. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, work hard, and then you'll and then you'll make it. And then, like, then we'll pay like, attention to you. And like, then we're ugh. like, okay, I'm Asian. I'm homeless. I don't have a job. I don't have an education. I'm like forty years old. What the, what the fuck am I gonna do? It's like, well, you're Asian. It's like, oh, okay, yeah. all right, very helpful. <laughs> yeah, nice. Like, helpful. <laughs> like, I'm gonna put that on my resume and see if that works. Oh, it's already there. Got it. <laughs> so, uh, uh shit. Yeah, I was gonna go on on uh, primes tonight, but I just didn't have time to read for the for the topic, so I ended up backing out. That's uh, what I have to go on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He told me, like, to, yeah, prime told me that in the email. I was like, "Child's coming too." And it's like, yeah, but like, I came rolling into one thing into another. But I'm sure it's gonna be a good talk. I don't know who's on it per se, but I'm sure it's probably the usual suspects. All right. Well, glad to talk to you. Uh... Yeah, man. I hope this was like finally the conversation that you could have like actually had about yeah, Asian American was, this, racism that wasn't last week. This was this was good. This was good. Yeah. Smaller smaller groups yield better results, I think, on panels and just discussions. Um and then also you 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 and I have and I, I tell you this, I tell you this all the time where it's like, sure, we're gonna disagree on a lot of things, but like I don't like hate your guts. And I think Likewise. something that happens in yeah, I think like something in discourse that happens a lot is like we go in the conversations of like, wow, Chow was really frustrating in that debate, but it's just his argument in the context of that debate. And him and I could sit down and probably have a good conversation of it, but panels kind of can prevent that from happening sometimes. So I think that there needs to be more, and this is 
also why I accepted this, like there needs to be more of like the panel topic broadly and then condensing it to smaller groups and people interacting in different ways, um, which can make for great content, especially since Destiny's banned. So different ways to decide. Finally, to let, I, I'm actually hoping for less drama. Oh, oh I'm so excited. <laughs> it's going to be so chill. So chill. All right. A tweet might come up every once in a while, but yeah. Oh, obviously. Yeah. I have to go now. Bye. Yeah. All right, man. See you. Talk to you soon.